Welcome back everybody to another episode of Direct Comparison. In today's episode, we're going to look at the retail build of Halo Infinite and see how its final release has evolved since its widely panned original gameplay premiere at E3 2020. For this analysis, I'll be playing Halo Infinite on the PC, running at a native 4K resolution with dynamic scaling disabled and all the visual effects cranked up to their highest available settings. Though, bear in mind that while we will be looking at some visual elements like textures, characters, and object models, the footage on the left will ultimately look blurrier at times, due to the video compression. So the primary focus for this video will be more on the environmental layout, mission structure, gameplay mechanics, and the overall design. So let's jump right into it, with the introductory cutscene of Master Chief and the pilot crash landing a Pelican VTOL onto Halo's surface. This entire cutscene remains nearly identical to the one first premiered back in 2020, with the same baseline animations, dialogue, and even some of the various effects. However, as you can plainly see, it looks almost completely different now thanks to a major overhaul to the character models, the texture work, and even the lighting design. Right from the onset, we can see that the pilot has much more detail along his face now, with an extra layer of dirt and grime, along with improved specular lighting and shader work to add more realism to the surface of his skin. His hair has also been given a noticeable bump in complexity, with more individual hair fibers that seem to blend more naturally with the texture work, and reflect light more naturally as well, especially along his upper lip. But one of the most noticeable changes has been made to his eyes. Both the iris and the cornea have been completely redone, with much sharper detail and better reflective properties to help give them a more believable, liquid, gel-like appearance. The only downside, though, is that for whatever reason, the retail build suffers from slightly more dithering when it comes to rendering the smaller lashes here, making them barely visible at some angles. As the scene continues, we get our first glimpse of the game's protagonist, Master Chief, whose iconic armor-plated suit has seen some major texture and shader reworks, resulting in a much more battle-hardened appearance. Scorch marks, scratches, and paint chipping can be found on each individual plate of Chief's armor, and the changes made to the ambient lighting in the scene helps texture work like the rubber material below his chest plate stand out even more prominently. The reflective visor has similarly been reworked, as there is a visible grime along the edges, additional scratch marks, and a sharper image being reflected, placing the character more firmly into the scene itself. As the scene progresses further, you'll also notice a few minor changes to the ambient background effects as well. These sparks, for example, seem to feature less bloom than they did before, but are ultimately sharper and less pixelated as a result. But as the scene begins to move to the back of the craft, we begin to run into a few more issues. For one, the volumetric fog and lighting seems to be a bit overwhelming, hiding details on the characters that were previously easy to distinguish between. And as the cargo bay doors open, we see some serious banding issues as light pours in through the open doors. There's also a few odd omissions like the lack of depth of field at this scene, and Chief's assault rifle that, for whatever reason, isn't on his back anymore. As the cutscene wraps up, Chief disembarks from the Pelican and ventures out onto the surface of the Halo ring itself. From here, the demo features about four and a half minutes of straight gameplay, as the player fights their way through banished forces to reach an anti-aircraft cannon in the distance. The pathing remains virtually identical to what was previously shown, though you may have already noticed some big changes to the visual makeup of the retail build that make it look almost like a completely different game. First, we have the Assault Rifle. This particular weapon design received a lot of criticism when it was first revealed, with many noting the weirdly clean, plastic look of the firearm and its various individual pieces. With the retail build, this weapon looks much more detailed, sporting a new yellow stripe and insignia on the outside of the integrated weapon sight, along with a layer of dirt and grime around the outside of each metal piece. The shading has also been reworked, transitioning away from that previous plastic look to something more metallic, assisted further by some subtle reflective properties. Next, we of course can't ignore the lighting. In Halo Infinite, the game's lighting when exploring the open world and completing side activities is mostly dynamic, as it transitions between several presets to achieve the best possible lighting conditions at any given moment. However, dedicated campaign missions, like the mission demoed here, have their own designated starting time that will gradually change as the player progresses further. 
Interestingly, this mission in the final retail build has had this start time moved up a bit to the late evening, as opposed to mid-afternoon like before. This results in a more golden look for the sequence, as biometric light shafts illuminate low-hanging fog across the valley. Considering the midday lighting conditions shown in the demo can still be achieved throughout the course of the retail game, this was likely just an artistic design choice, done to accentuate a particular mood for the mission itself. But even had the lighting been made to line up exactly, there's still several changes made to the environmental objects and textures that are worth noting. For one, the grass here, outside of the pelican, has been replaced by a worn dirt path, with only a few patches of grass, rocks, twigs, and some subtle tessellation applied to add more depth. Thick grass fields like this one here can still be found all throughout the retail build, so it seems the environmental artists incorporated a more destroyed look to this area, as this is the approximate location where large sections of the Infinity supercarrier can be found. Along with these cosmetic choices, many of the environmental assets here have also seen some great improvements, most notably the boulders off to the side, that now sport crisp 4K texture work and improved ambient occlusion, this applies to all other rock formations, especially the distant cliffs that border the play area, that initially lacked proper shadowing and suffered from a remarkably low LOD. There's even a few areas where you can now make out additional hexagonal pillars jutting out of the rocks, building on Infinite's unique sci-fi aesthetic. As the player turns back towards the path, you may also notice some small alien creatures roaming in the grass. As the grass has been removed from this location, these animals no longer spawn here. However, similar small wildlife can be found occasionally in Infinite's open world, including the same rodent creatures and various types of birds. As the camera pans further, we get our first glimpse of enemy combatants, a small group of grunts standing by the edge of the water. Interestingly, the enemy placement here has not been retained. There's no enemies to shoot at in this immediate area. However, the retail build does feature a group of enemies standing below the wreckage of the Infinity nearby, whereas in the demo, there are no enemies here at all. You'll also notice in this area more evidence of the scorched earth design I mentioned earlier, as some of the trees have now been stripped of their leaves, indicating a previous large fire, and the grass has been scaled back almost entirely, expanding the size of the body of water. The water effects have seen some nice improvements as well, eliminating the odd, blurry surface reflection from before almost entirely, and providing more depth to the ripples across the surface. It also has more brown coloration to it, no doubt caused by the different time of day. After looking at the wrecked infinity, Chief then turns to watch a nearby banished transport fly overhead. This particular aircraft does not appear in the retail build at this moment. However, they are featured all throughout the game, both during scripted moments and dynamically as banished forces reinforce each other in the open world. After spotting the anti-aircraft cannon on a nearby cliff, Chief then rushes to a nearby warthog parked in the shade, and then drives across the waterbed towards the wreckage. The warthog itself actually hasn't seen too many changes. Like with Chief's armor, the model is near identical and seems to control about the same as well, but the metallic sidings have been reworked to feature more dents and scratches, and the reflective properties are definitely more pronounced than they were before. It's also worth noting the continued differences made to the terrain decor, as the dirt texture maps below the Warthog offer a much higher resolution in the retail build, and things like rocks, bushes, trees, and grass all look significantly better thanks to proper shadowing and the bumped up LOD. After reaching the top of this hill, the player then enters into the game's map screen to survey the nearby mission objectives. Even this map screen has seen a number of changes, most notably the addition of coloration to playable areas, adding a bit of green to offset the overabundance of blue from before, along with a slight redesign to the UI itself. After closing the map, the player then speeds down a slope towards some nearby enemies and launches off a ramp into an even wider open space, providing this gorgeous action shot of the warthog soaring through the air. Here we get another glimpse of the change to the time of day, with the sun being nearly eclipsed by the distant peaks, therefore hiding the nice reflective light shown here in the demo. However, the shot also highlights another example of just how much better the LOD is in the retail build, as the small details along the walls of the banished structure in the distance can now be clearly seen, whereas before, only the most basic shape of the structure was on display. After landing, 
The Warthog then speeds through a group of enemies and stops by a pile of crates. The player then gets out and proceeds to gun down a few enemies using his assault rifle and pistol. Surprisingly, the enemy designs, specifically this grunt here, have not been changed all that much, if at all. The texture quality looks about the same, the details along his armor match up almost identically, and animations seem to be similar as well. Next, we get a glimpse at our second weapon in the demo, the Magnum Pistol. This model isn't quite as complex as the assault rifle from before, though it does sport some similar changes, including worn texture work and paint chipping along the edges. The retail version also sports some new red night sights as well, though, because you can't ADS with this weapon, their inclusion is purely cosmetic based. After firing and swapping off the pistol, we get to see the assault rifle in action for both versions. And while the muzzle flash effect looks more or less the same, I did notice something interesting with how the muzzle flash is now handled. Previously, the muzzle flash was just an alpha effect, appearing after every few rounds fired in full auto. But in the retail build, light is also emitted and reflected off of the barrel alongside and between these alpha effects, helping to sell the weapon's full auto rate of fire even more. It's a minor change, but one that goes a long way in making the animation more convincing. After defeating this elite with a melee attack, the player turns back towards the path and grabs a new weapon off the ground, the Commando, and turns to fire on a group of approaching grunts off to the side. Like before, this weapon has seen some texture reworks to make it appear more worn and dirty, along with some touch-ups to the flip-up holographic sight and the ammo display on the side, though it's otherwise exactly the same. The player then heads towards the base of the cliff towards a large elevator, slowly descending from above. This is probably one of the more impressive improvements from the demo, as this particular section looked almost unfinished before. The individual hexagonal columns, for example, didn't have any lines distinguishing themselves from one another when viewed from the underside, and the material itself didn't appear reflective before, but now reflects both the sun and the red glow from the elevator very nicely. Even the rocky columns jutting out from the top sport enhanced detail now, and cast much better shadows against the nearby metal columns, instead of the jagged shadows that were cast previously. As the player moves forward, a pair of brutes drop down in pods to attack the player. Here is probably one of the demo's most infamous blunders, as the second brute meleeed by the player quickly became a popular meme online, thanks to his lifeless design. As expected, the brute models and the animation work has been updated to address this concern, adding additional details like facial hair and high-res skin textures, while also ensuring that their mouths now open when engaged in combat or yelling out at the player. It's something that most players probably wouldn't have noticed considering the average engagement distance throughout the game, but it's still nice to see that this was improved either way. What's even more interesting, however, is that these two brutes have actually been changed out entirely. Initially, these enemies shown in the demo were a melee-focused brute type called Berserkers that will chase the player down as soon as they're alerted. But the retail build uses more conventional soldier types that will remain near their drop pods and attack from range. The Berserkers are featured prominently all throughout Halo Infinite, so this was likely done for balancing reasons instead. After these two enemies, the player then rushes forward again and is met with a third brute armed with a Ravager and a jetpack forcing the player to make use of various tools like an energy shield, sticky grenades, and the grapple shot. All of these abilities are available in the final game, and function about the same as well. But this enemy has also been changed from a standard jetpack brute into a brute captain, armed with a new energy weapon called the Heat Wave, not the Ravager. After defeating this brute, the player then moves to the elevator and slowly ascends up the large cliff face, looking out at the wide-reaching open world environment. As many have noted in the past, this particular wide shot suffered from severe pop-in with distant environmental assets like trees, rocks, and other objects swapping between their low detail variants in a pretty noticeable way. The retail build, however, doesn't appear to suffer from this nearly as much, if at all, with a gorgeous view of the distant cliffs free of any unintended abnormalities. Other details featured previously, like the scripted birds that fly by and rest on the upper platform remain intact as well and transition into the next big combat sequence up on top. Here the action gets a bit disjointed, as it's difficult to really match up such a dynamic combat sequence with the game's AI. Though it is worth noting that the standout feature here 
the suicide grunt that's thrown by a brute, is still featured in the final game, and will occur occasionally throughout the campaign. After the fight, the player then turns towards the AA cannon again, and pulses the objective using their visor before heading towards an elevated catwalk and grappling up a rock wall. This maneuver, made possible by the grapple shot, is used extensively throughout the course of Halo Infinite for Traversal, and works exactly the same as when it was first premiered, and therefore can also be used to grab nearby explosive containers which can then be tossed at enemies for an easy kill. During the fight, the player also makes use of a new drum-fed shotgun called the Bulldog, and clears out various enemies before ascending via a gravity lift towards the controls of the first anti-aircraft cannon. Finally, the demo wraps up with another cinematic cutscene, this time introducing Infinite's lead antagonist, Eshram, who provides a lengthy monologue once the player interacts with the cannon's terminal. Because the AI character known as The Weapon hadn't been officially revealed back when the demo first premiered, the E3 version actually skips over her short segment at the start of the cinematic, though the rest of the dialogue from Eshram himself remains the same. Additionally, Eshram's hologram is now more detailed in the final build, and the holographic red ambient light has been tweaked as well, making it easier to pick out details on the model. Finally, the hologram does not smoothly transition into a live view of Eshram in color, but instead fades out as the player's mission has only just begun. Overall, I'm very impressed with the final presentation of Halo Infinite in relation to the original 2020 showing. 343 Industries addressed many of the biggest concerns in regards to the game's visuals and delivered a solid looking campaign, coupled with some enjoyable gameplay mechanics and a lot of additional side activities to uncover. The final game certainly has its shortcomings, especially in regards to its multiplayer offerings, its performance, and some of the cinematic animations, but there's no denying that 343 Industries have absolutely redeemed themselves in regards to the visual makeup of both this gameplay sequence and the whole of the game as well. But what do you guys think? Are you happy with the final retail build of Halo Infinite? Or are you disappointed by something that was cut out? Let me know what you think in the comments section. Also, if you haven't watched it yet, be sure to check out my full breakdown of the entire Halo series, now available on my channel, including an in-depth look at each game's development, story, gameplay, and how the response from audiences helped to shape the series into what it is today. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos like this posted every week.